September 1933, the German National Church held a synod where the Jewish question was to be debated. In preparation, Dietrich Bonhoeffer released a paper, The Church and the Jewish Question. If the church in Australia, the UK, Europe or United States were to hold such a church council on the Jewish question in the wake of October 7th, I wonder who would attend and what would be said. In Bonhoeffer Part 1, I considered the post-World War I perfect storm in church and society that enabled the Nazis to come to power in Germany. In Part 2, we considered the faith of Bonhoeffer and why most of the German church embraced Hitler rather than resisting him on the basis of scripture. As Bonhoeffer became a true disciple of Jesus rather than a cultural Christian, and as he read the scriptures, he discovered how God viewed the Jews and shockingly was quite opposite to the anti-Semitic attitudes in most of German society. So today in part three, the Jewish question. This was an issue for Germany in World War II, but all countries around the globe. Because as Germany began expelling and exterminating the Jews, nations were forced to decide what to do with them. Would they let the Jews into their countries or turn them away? And today, the Jewish question is again on the lips of all nations. News story after news story, Israel is the subject. What did Bonhoeffer discover as he read his Bible that helped form his conviction about the Jews that he was willing to risk his life about? And what do we need to learn and step into if we are to prevent another Holocaust? Jesus and Paul both made explicit statements about the Jews. And of course, the Old Testament is the history of Israel. Matthew chapter 1 records the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew 1, 1 says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Luke 2 verse 5, Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem for the census because it was their hometown. They were both direct descendants of King David. Jesus was clearly Jewish. His family went way back to Abraham. And at his birth and his death, it was declared about Jesus, King of the Jews. In John 4.22, Jesus had a historic conversation with the woman at the well. In discussing the place where they should worship, Jesus said, salvation is from the Jews. In Matthew 10, Jesus sent out disciples with specific instructions to only go to the house of Israel, not to the Gentiles, at least for that time. To understand how God sees the Jews today, we must properly understand the book of Romans and see uh, my series that I've done on Romans is vital. Romans 3.2 says God distinguished the Jews from all other people by entrusting them with the revelation of his prophetic promises. And in Romans 9.14, uh, sorry, Romans 9.1 and 4, O Israel, my Jewish family, said Paul, to you belong God's glorious presence, the covenants, the Torah, the temple with its sacrifices and the promises of God. We trace our beginnings back to the patriarchs and through their bloodline, is the genealogy of Messiah, who is God over everything. In Romans eleven fifteen, Paul said the Jewish people being reconciled to God is key for revival to be released to the entire world, something we're still waiting for. No wonder the devil has targeted the family of Jesus, whose direct lineage and ancestry is Jewish. In Romans eleven twenty five to 29, it says a partial and temporary hardening to the gospel has come over Israel, which will last until the full number of Gentiles has come to God's family. And then God will bring all Israel to salvation. Their opposition has opened the door of the gospel to you who are not Jewish. Yet they are still greatly loved by God because their ancestors were divinely chosen to be his. So when the Jewish question arose in Germany, Bonhoeffer wrestled with God and these scriptures. Not only did Hitler murder six million Jews, but he spoke openly about trying to eradicate the Jewishness of Jesus and the potency of the blood of Jesus to redeem. 
Our beliefs and treatment of the Jews is indicative of how we really view Jesus and the gospel. Our ability to resist evil is inevitably linked to how we treat and treat the Jewish people. Karen Davis sings Israel, my beloved. The beautiful voice of Karen Davis singing Israel, my beloved, the Lord calling Israel to himself. Now, the problem for Bonhoeffer, read the German National Church Synod of September 1933, was that up to 80% of the attendees were brown shirts. Now, since October the 7th and the Palestinian protesters, many have likened them to the brown shirts. And the brown shirts were Hitler's bullies or stormtroopers, young people. And so to discuss the, que the Jewish question with 80% of anti-Semites would be like you or I going to a Palestinian protest at a university today and giving them the scriptures about the Jewish people. It would take some soul searching and we'd need to weigh up our conviction and have our facts right ready and be ready for whatever. Now Bonhoeffer's family were part of Berlin Upper Society. Dietrich's father was a prominent psychiatrist in Berlin Many Jewish doctors, lawyers, thinkers, musicians and theologians were among their friends and family. Dietrich's own twin sister married a Jewish lawyer who later became a Lutheran pastor. And as German society changed its attitude towards the Jews, the Jewish question became very personal to Bonhoeffer and it became an issue of division in the church. Dietrich needed a biblical response for churchmen, and the brown shirts. As we consider the gradual decline in Germany, we need to see what drove Bonhoeffer to write, to speak and make the choices he did. Nazi Germany began with wrong beliefs about Jesus and his Jewish family. There was actually a decade of lies, and this is important for us to see what's happening in our society. Germany began with the wrong beliefs. In a 1922 speech, Hitler called Jesus, quote, our greatest Aryan hero, end quote. He presented a false Jesus who was not Jewish, but rather a blue-eyed, blonde-haired European. Today, anti-Jewish sentiment paints Jesus as an Arab or a Palestinian. Bethlehem proudly claims that the city is a birthplace of Jesus, mainly to get the tourist dollars, uh, they claim him as a Palestinian. Yet Matthew 1 and two, Luke 2 seemingly has been forgotten or taken out of their Bibles. Paul warned the Galatian church in first chapter, if another gospel is preached, it would bring a curse or cause such a preacher, even an angel, to be excommunicated. Many agreed with Hitler's statement, not only eradicating the Jewishness of Jesus, but also believed Jesus was a cruel anti-Semite himself. So it was no stretch for these so-called Christians to call Jews Christ killers and brutalize them in inverted commas, the name of Christ. I will come back to their anti-Semitic beliefs in a moment because sadly these libels continue today. Many Jews were tortured and killed by those who said they were inverted commas Christians and has severely affected Jewish attitudes towards Christians today. And it's been one of the big tasks that we've been involved in for and others praying for is Jews today, that we've had to be in this space of repentance and reconciliation for these very wrong beliefs. Anti-Jewish sentiment grew and festered for a whole decade before it erupted into Nazi Germany persecution. A decade after Hitler's speech in 1922, in 1932, Hitler gave a personal assurance to important church leaders. Number one, he said he would keep his hands off the church. And number two, there would be no pogroms against the Jews. Martin Niemöller was a decorated U-boat captain from World War I. At first, he thought the Nazis would restore German dignity, restore moral order and chase the communists from the country. After Hitler gave assurance that both the church and the Jews would be kept safe, he thought the Nazis could be the answer to prayer to bring national religious revival. 
But when he realised these were all lies, he teamed up with Bonhoeffer to resist the Nazis. In 1933, Hitler praised churches, more as a deceit, as the bastions of morality and traditional values. But he actually wanted to use the churches for Nazi ideology to placate them at first and then change the direction once they were on board. In public, he sounded pro-church or pro-Christian to gain public support. But in private, he was against Christianity and Christians. Many pastors thought Hitler was on their side and thus happy to work with him, even though he spoke about the doctrine of redemption as, quote, old-fashioned, mystical, out-of-date nonsense, and that sin and grace were weak Jewish attitudes. March of 1933, the basic rights anchored in the Constitution were suspended. Hitler's regime could now pass any laws because there were no parliamentary controls over him, especially against political adversaries. I wonder if the West faces any threat to democracy today. We need to beware. On April the 1st of 1933, interesting it was April Fool's Day, Jews were seen as enemies of the Aryan race. The boycott of Jewish shops and businesses began. Jewish shops, law firms and doctor's offices had signs put outside of them which said, Germans, defend yourselves, don't buy from Jews. And the brown shirts threatened any potential customers and clients with violence if they went into these businesses. On April the 7th, 1933, the Aryan paragraph came into law. April the 7th, Jews were barred from holding civil service, university and state positions which flowed on to other uh, positions later on. May the 10th, the public book burning of books. July the 14th, East European Jewish immigrants were stripped of German citizenship. Many Jews believed the Reich would soon collapse, but it got worse. And it was at this stage the church met to discuss the Jewish question. This was the beginning of the persecution of German Jews. Remember, it only took a decade of wrong thinking. 1922, 1922, the year my mum was born, Hitler was making statements that Jesus was not Jewish. A decade later, in 1933, the Aryan paragraph became law. Wrong thinking is too easy. Consistent libel lies, which I'll go into these in a moment. But it's a challenge to us in our society. How did this happen? How did this wrong, easy thinking happen? Well, Goebbels was in charge of Nazi propaganda unit to manipulate and deceive the German people. He believed if they told a lie often enough, the people will think it's truth. And today we have propaganda accusing conservative voices, Bible believers or those wanting freedoms, or they're anti-Semitic or they're Nazis. Lying spirits are everywhere to deceive. Jesus warned us it was an end time issue. And we need to make sure we've got the armour of God on, the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth and so forth. In 2021, 60 Minutes did a documentary on the rise of Jew-hating Nazis in Victoria. The federal police have them on their radar, but they increasingly show up at protests. And now... Many protesters, as we know, on the streets and universities are against Israel and Holocaust survivors are scared. They see similarities to these early 1930 events. None of our laws have really changed yet, thankfully, but there's pressure on them. And I have met, as I've said before, Jewish people in Melbourne who've had their businesses attacked and jobs lost since October the 7th. Jewish students and lecturers have been prevented from going to classes and many Jewish students in Australia are threatened if wearing their symbols or school clothes and extra security has needed. Are we in a dangerous position? We're going to listen to the Habrit, which is the covenant of God to remind us how important that is and then Marty Gert singing for Zion's sake. Before we go back to the timeline in Germany, let's consider the ideology that drove these changes. In 1 John 4 verses 2 to 3, it says the test for the spirit of the Antichrist is whoever denies Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God come in the flesh. In the mosque on the Temple Mount, there's a sign saying, 
God has no son. So if you want to know what's really going on, go to 1 John chapter 4 to see what the qualifications are. Many false statements have been made against the Jews over millennia, and they've been what has caused a lot of trouble. And sadly, we're seeing it again today. Sometimes they're called blood libels or variations. They're against the word, they're anti-Semitic, and they're the basis of replacement theology. Again, I point you to the complete program I did on that, which is on our YouTube channel. But these are all the arguments used in Nazi Germany to suggest to put in the Aryan paragraph. So Bonhoeffer dug into scripture, and I pray these things I share make you dig into scripture too. So also I need to say Israel and the Jewish people are like us. Many make mistakes and sin against God and others. But the word of God says he does return them to their land. He will cleanse their hearts and he is doing that work right now. But God chose them as his people. There are prophetic promises and we owe them a debt because they gave us our Messiah and our scriptures. So the first libel is what's called deicide. In other words, to kill God. Jews are often called Christ killers. The basis is this. They rejected and crucified Jesus. The statement at the crucifixion, his blood be on our head, is often quoted. And they are often targeted for murder because they are considered to be Christ killers. Replacement theology says they rejected Jesus, therefore they are cursed. The Gentile church replaces them, therefore everything Jewish should be removed from Christianity. That's the very simple version. Blood libels. Well, these statements say that Jews have murdered non-Jews, such as Christian children, in order to use their blood in rituals, especially to make matzah for Passover. This was actually printed as front page newspapers in Nazi Germany. Now, the truth is that in the food laws in the book of Leviticus, followed by the Jews, all blood must be drained from meat. No blood is to be eaten. And if you buy uh, meat in Israel, it's very pale because there's absolutely no blood. We have more in ours. And these false accusations have been since medieval times and often the basis for murdering Jews. The next one is called the dirty slash filthy Jews. A long list of Jewish stereotypes to cast Jews as unworthy, unclean and greedy. The first one of these is poisoning the well. An accusation from the 14th century bubonic plague blamed the Jews for pur purposefully spreading disease. The truth is their hygiene and dietary laws meant they survived the plague, but they were murdered because they survived. Then the second accusation of greed includes being excessively money oriented, exploiting others for personal gain, being overly wealthy and controlling the world's finances. Despite today, many Jews in Israel are actually poor. A 2003 TV series broadcast in Syria and Lebanon based on the protocols of the elders of Zion accuses the Jewish people in a conspiracy to rule the world. And many Christians still believe that today. Then we go on. There's twisted New Testament scriptures to suit the anti-Jewish rhetoric. For example, in John 8, 44, when Jesus addressed the Pharisees, he said, you are of your father, the devil. Therefore, people say all Jews are of the devil. Then there's the thing that the New Testament should be revised to remove emphasis of the crucified Christ. The Nazis mocked Paul because sin and grace were Jewish attitudes, weak and un-German, even though the Reformation was based on grace. And then there's the issue of remove the Old Testament. It's a cunning Jewish conspiracy. Today we hear it's a lesser authority. And Jewish uh, church music, remove all Israeli elements or references. Hebrew words like hallelujah, hosanna or Jerusalem should be removed from church music. I was actually once told by a pastor that I could not have any songs that had Hebrew words in it. So you can see that these sorts of things continue today. The next libel is that they're colonists. 
One of the slogans commonly used against Israel is that they're a setter colonial enterprise who stole Arab land. Now, these arguments are used in the conflicts right now today. Biblical history shows that Jewish people were given the land by God 3,000 years ago, and they are indigenous to the land. Psalm 83 identifies all Israel's neighbours would turn on her and say, and I quote verse 4, our enemies keep saying, now is the time to wipe Israel off the map. We'll destroy even the memory of her existence. Her name shall be remembered no more. My goodness, that could have been written today as we hear chants in our streets from the river to the sea, because that's basically what that means. But Israel rejecting Jesus was for our benefit. Please listen to my series on Romans to understand that. Romans 11.11 11 says, so I am saying that Israel stumbled so badly they will never get back up, asked Paul. Certainly not. Rather, it was because of their stumble. Salvation now extends to all non-Jewish people in order to make Israel jealous and desire the very things that God has freely given them. We Christians need to be grateful for the Jews. Thankful God chose to graft us into the vine. Realize the privilege that our walk with God, when it's fervent and righteous, makes the Jews jealous to return back to their faith in God, return to the Father. Our job is to make them jealous and to pray for them, not to kill, to kill them. Paul Wilbur sings, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Paul Wilbur singing, pray for the peace of Jerusalem and praying that the Jewish people would turn and worship Adonai again, that they would declare that Messiah has come. So in 1933, although it was still five years before Kristallnacht and six years before World War II, pressure was on the church. The Jews had become the scapegoat of the nation and the church faced a dilemma. They were required, asked to enforce the Aryan paragraph. That was to really exclude the Jews from all of society. The church was in turmoil. Some felt they should make peace with the Nazis, even though Hitler wanted the church to be under him. Some thought the opportunities for evangelism would increase. And some suggested the Jews who were baptised as Christians could form their own church distinct from the German church. The lines between church and state became blurred. And at the conference of 1933, Bonhoeffer declared it was the duty of the church to stand up for the church, for the Jews. He had many Jewish friends and relatives and had been re-examining what scripture said about the Jews. He was convinced a church not willing to stand up for the Jews was not the real church of Jesus. Bonhoeffer said, and I quote, what is at stake is by no means whether our German members of congregations can still tolerate church fellowship with the Jews. It is rather the task of Christians preaching to say, here is the church where Jew and German stand together under the word of God. Here is the proof of whether a church is still the church or not. The Lord had spoken to Bonhoeffer through many scriptures, including Galatians 3, 26 to 29. All are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free, male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Bonhoeffer was not only asking what is the church's response to the Jewish question, but he was also asking what is the church? Can a church without Jews be the real church? He eventually concluded that the existence of Christianity all across Europe was at stake on this question. When the church fails to be the church, society pays the price, and that applies to us as well. It became law that every German pastor must take an oath of personal allegiance to Hitler, and they must enforce the Aryan paragraph and expel every church member of Jewish descent. This required three things. One, they had to cease publishing and disseminating the Bible. It had to be removed from their churches. Importance of knowing your scriptures now. Number two, Mein Kampf was to be the greatest document and the only document on the altar in churches. Now, in a recent program, I said that Mein Kampf 
uh, Hitler's document and vision was found recently in Gaza, but it was to be on the altar in churches. Number three, the Christian cross had to be removed and superseded by the SWAT sticker, which if you look into that is an occult symbol. So the result of the 1933 conference and the requirements of the Nazis, it ended in a split in the church. There were two Protestant churches. One was under state control and the confessing church, which the state did not recognise. In 1934, Bonhoeffer's group, the confessing church, released a declaration which stated their beliefs. They printed this declaration in the London Times, which announced to the world that a group of Christians in Germany declared independence from the Nazi church. They resisted the pressure for the church to be an instrument of Nazi propaganda and politics. Bonhoeffer's writings and lectures were important in articulating these views. They were especially active in protesting against euthanasia and the persecution of the Jews and holding the traditional view of Jesus and salvation. Increasingly, the confessing church was forced underground, and by 1937, many of their clergy were arrested. Hitler's church party, called the official German Christians, gained control of the Evangelical Church of Germany. They tolerated many Nazi policies, and especially the doctrine of the racial Aryan superiority. Their theme was one Reich, one people and one church. Ezekiel 34, the Lord addressed the false shepherds, how they had destroyed Israel and, and us, of course, with false gods and rebelling against the Lord. But the Lord promised he would give Israel a shepherd like King David to care for them. In, in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 28 to, 20, uh, to 30, it says, Foreign powers will no longer plunder them. They will live safe and secure. They will no longer have to endure the insults of other nations. So they will know that I, Yahweh, am with them as their God. And they, the people of Israel, will know that they are my people, declares the Lord Yahweh. Karen Davis sings, The word of the Lord. And it's Karen Davis singing about the word of God, which is the same yesterday, today and forever. Hallelujah, because it's like reading the newspapers, isn't it? When we see the things that are taking place in, and it's there in the scriptures, as I've been showing you. As we um, return to the timeline in Nazi Germany, Bonhoeffer knew that God had spoken to him about the Jews. They were God's people. And what happened next fits with the warning in Psalm 74, a desperate prayer of Asaph pleading with God not to cast off the Jewish people. Psalm 74 verse 8 says, the enemies of God boast and said, let's completely crush them. Let's wipe out every trace of this God. Let's burn up every sacred place where they worship this God. Or some translators say, burn all God's houses, all the synagogues in the land. All this was about to happen. In 1935, May the 31st, Jews were barred from serving in the German armed form forces, which is interesting because in World War I, many Jews were heroes of the army. And this actually caused a lot of confusion. And then September the 15th, the Nuremberg Laws came in. Jews no longer had citizenship. They were not allowed to fly the German flag and they were not allowed to marry Aryans. And a Jew was defined as anyone with three Jewish grandparents. So that was wiping out three generations like Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. In 1936, Jewish doctors were barred from practicing medicine. And in 1938, mandatory reg registration of all property held by Jews. And then we come to November the 9th and 10th of, of uh, 1938. Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, a key marker. 200 synagogues were, were destroyed, 7,500 Jewish shops looted, 91 Jews were murdered, 30,000 male Jews were sent to concentration camps. A couple of days later, Jews had to transfer all businesses to Aryan hands. A few more days later, all Jewish children were expelled from German schools. And on December the 12th, can you believe this? 
Jews were fined for the destruction of property during Kristallnacht. Unbelievable. In 1939, concentration camps, Yellow Stars and World War II all began in earnest. In the Jerusalem Post of October 2023, the heinous crimes perpetrated on October the 7th, this was said, those crimes cannot be equated with any other event in world history. They have no parallel. As awful as Kristallnacht was, the mass murder and savagery that Hamas's marauding murderers perpetrated in Israel on October the 7th was worse. Now that's a sobering statement. If Kristallnacht was not as bad as October the 7th, where are we? I mentioned earlier about Nimola, the heroic U-boat, U-boat captain who uh, at first agreed to be part of Hitler's church. He was a church leader and he said he would be the uh, a leader in this approved church. But he later turned back on that and he actually became uh, a personal prisoner of Hitler and he was put into a concentration camp for eight years after working with Bonhoeffer. And he is the one that wrote these famous words. First, they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. Church, we must speak while we can. Let us not be like those famous words spoken, that there was no one left to fight for us. We need to discover the lies that are being sown into society right now. Find the truth in scripture and be the ecclesia, the Lord's legislative assembly. Declare his truth to principalities and powers, to politicians, to media. We must be his voice today. Evil done to the Jews was actually evil done to God. The Jews are the brethren of Jesus. There are no words to describe the evil of the Aryan paragraph and subsequent Holocaust. There are key lessons for us. The foundation of the Holocaust murder were several sins and lies, and I'm just going to summarize them. Number one, idolatry. Germans, they believed, they were descendants of the Aryan gods in Wagner's opera themes. The German folklore, akin to Greek mythology, but heroes were German gods. The Aryan paragraph was built upon Aryan idolatry. It's also pride. They saw the Aryan gods and the people were above Yahweh. Number two, they had a wrong view of Jesus. He was Aryan, not Jewish. Many Jews thought actually Jesus was Catholic. Our friend Shimshon gave a testimony that on radio of how he thought Jesus was a Jew and he hated him. But he had a revelation and he, he came to him. Muslims say God has no son. And how many years has Bethlehem been calling uh, it the home of Jesus the Palestinian? It's actually about a decade. The truth about Jesus is critical to us not being deceived. And the third thing uh, underpinning this was the wounds, rejection and bitterness. Hitler was inspired by Luther's writings at the end of his life, where in his book of 1543, Luther wrote, uh, the book was called On the Jews and Their Lies. And Luther wrote, they, the Jews, are of the devil, burn their synagogues. And Hitler approved and carried out. Sadly, the Nazis approved church felt eradicating the Jews would, in, in quote, complete the Reformation. When we visited Wittenberg in 2014, I began to understand how this last thing could happen. I don't condone it, but I understood it. And we stood there at that church and we prayed, we repented and wept for the church where this happened. You see, the street where Luther's church was situated bordered with the Jewish section of town. It was right across the road. At first, Luther had preached to them, helped them and cared for the Jewish community, but they would not respond to the gospel. Luther was basically wounded and offended by Jewish rejection of the gospel. What a warning to us. Luther gave Germany the best and the worst. 
The Reformation began from a powerful revelation and was called the Singing Revival because of all the songs he wrote. His sad end of calling for the burning of synagogues was the result of bitterness. And Hebrews 12 warns us to deal with our wounds and bitternesses so others are not infected. Sadly, Hitler and Nazi Germany was infected by Luther's bitterness and they murdered Jews in, in quote, in the name of Jesus. O oh Lord, forgive us for such sins. The Jewish people were not just removed by Nazi Germany. Also in the mid 20th century is what's called the forgotten exodus. 800,000 Jews were driven from their homes in Arab nations and Iran. Baghdad had the biggest Jewish population of 120,000 plus, and they were expelled from Iraq in 1951. Alexandria had some 25,000 Jews. Following the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948 and the Six-Day War, they were all expelled by Egypt's President, President Nassar. Anti-Semitism is deep and has given great trauma to them. Nations have pr pledged never again. But will we resist evil? History and scripture warn us not to get complacent and to be careful. In Matthew 25, Jesus spoke of judging sheep and goat nations based on leaving him hungry, thirsty, poorly clothed, sick or in prison. They asked him, when was he ever like that? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to these, my brethren, you did it to me. Who are his brethren? He was pointing to his Jewish family. The nations will be judged by what they've done to Israel. The Lord's mercy exceeds his judgment for Israel and for us. That was the beautiful voice of Karen Davis singing, Your mercy and his mercies endure forever. Bless his name. There's two issues I just want to quickly raise as we finish off today. First of all, racism was a result of the Aryan idolatry and pride. Jesus spoke in the end times that there would be wars between nations, but that word for nation is actually ethnicity. So the end of days is racial wars between ethnicities. All racism is evil and demonic. Yet we are seeing critical race theory being taught in our schools, seeing all whites as colonial perpetrators and other skin colors as victims. If you listen to the son of Hamas, he was born in Ham Ramallah. His dad helped to form Hamas. And he says the people that are called Palestinians are actually Arabs. And he calls it out. He said these people are sadly being used for political gain and they're exploiting the victim card. This is not the ways of the Lord. The truth is this. Every person on planet Earth is created in the image of God and equal in the sight of God. Pride and evil puts one above another. At the cross, Jesus dealt with all enmity. And in fact, in Ephesians 2, it talks about Jew and Gentiles, the enmity between them. And it says in Ephesians 2 verse 15, ethnic hatred has been dissolved by the crucifixion of his precious body on the cross. By the blood of Jesus, victims become victors. Perpetrators are forgiven and transformed and ethnicities become one. We must not use ethnicity as a basis for divide in the body of Christ. The second thing I need to just say quickly is that there is a spiritual pattern in scripture that when Israel is faithful to God to worship him only, they are blessed. And when they are unfaithful to him and they worship other gods, they go into exile. And that's been a pat that's also a pattern for us. We are blessed as we obey God and worship him. But if we follow other gods, there is um 
it just doesn't go well for us. And there are curses that come. But scripture is very clear about the end times for Israel, that she would come back into her land. It would be God's grace to bring Israel, gather them, the exiles from all across the world and bring them back. And he says, for the sake of his holy name. And he says that in that process, he will remove all her idols. And I believe God's in this process right now. Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 17 to 19 to, and then 21 says, The Lord Yahweh says, I will gather you back, Israel, from the countries where you've been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. When you return, you will purge the land of all its filthy idols and detestable practices. I will give you a new undivided heart and put a new spirit in you. Ezekiel 20, When I deal with you, not as you deserve because of your wickedness, but in a way that brings honor to my name. And then you, the people of Israel, will recognize that I am God. I, Yahweh, have spoken. Joshua Aaron sings, Oh, the blood of Jesus. For the video on replacement theology, We'll put the link up here or down in the description box and also the messages on the book of Romans. Thank you for joining us. Give us a like and a share and subscribe, please. That really helps us to get the word out.